tonight, missing biometric verification device from the Volter region leaves NDC and MPP at each other's throats at emergency inter-party advisory committee meeting called by the Electoral Commission. The NDC's intelligence that picked up the theft case, I would say over 97% of the questions were not answered. As new patriotic party, we think that the engagement we've had today, the EC has been open when they had closed their discussion together. We have the latest from both parties and here from Kodeo. They independently monitored what happened today. We'll get an independent view. This is Top Story with Evans Mensah. Tonight, it is emerging at least one biometric voter verification device may still be missing, leaving the governing MPP and the opposition NDC at each other's throats at an emergency inter-party advisory committee meeting. Whereas the NDC claims the EC confirmed at the meeting that indeed some biometric verification devices were missing, the MPP insists such claims are untrue. First, listen to Dr. Mani Boama of the NDC making these claims in an interview with the media after the IPAC meeting. The theft at the headquarters of the Electoral Commission. And I must say, it is very disappointing the attitude of the MPP towards this theft. Why? Because if we can have the headquarters the Electoral Commission of Ghana under CCTV surveillance and the significant components of biometric verification registration kits are stolen. And listen to me carefully. The EC did not voluntarily supply the information. It was the NDC's intelligence that picked up the theft case and questioned the EC in Parliament. The question is, but for the NDC's intelligence picking this up, when will the EC have informed the political parties? And so, when the agenda included this briefing on the biometric devices, we decided that we will put forward the pertinent questions which we read all to them. I will say over 97% of the questions were not answered. And I'll take you through them. Uh, Sam Mbura is with me. He's been there listening to the NDC. Uh, when uh, Dr. Maniboma says he would take us through them, uh, Sam Mbura will help us understand what exactly he was referring to. Also joining me right now is the MPP's uh, Director of Elections, Evans Nemako. Hello, Mr. Nemako. Thanks for your time here on Top Story. Thank you for having me. Uh, Sam Mbura, to you first. You, you were there when you heard Dr. Maniboma claim that uh, more than 90% of the questions that he asked at the IPAC meeting have not been answered. What were these questions precisely? So um, I must say that the issues before IPAC, I mean, had to do with the upcoming judicial election. And this BV, uh, as the DVD issue was one of the critical issues that they discussed. So after the meeting, the parties did not have to, uh, seem not to have problems with the other issues that were before the committee. But uh, particularly about the BVDs, the NDC said it wasn't happy about the way the EC has handled the reported theft case. So, Mr. or Dr. Omani Boama claims that um, per the investigations of the uh, NDC, the BVDs and the BVRs are indeed missing, but the EC is trying to show the information from the public. So, he raised the question that did the EC 
actually report the case to the police at the time the reported theft was detected. Um, what did the technical people of the EC tell, tell them when they detected that this, um, or these uh, machines were not accounted for? So he said these and other questions were what they posed to the EC before uh, the IPAC meeting. But the EC did not give definite answers, but deferred those questions to the technical team. He says the questions were technical and it needed the input of their technical team to clarify some of these issues. Because the NDC wanted to find out, are these machines just laptops, as you say? Because in your statement, you claim that the uh, missing or the unaccounted for um, devices were just laptops, cameras, and uh, printers that did not have any consequence or um, has, uh, have any potential of rigging the election. So uh, why did these uh, machines get missing and why didn't they go public to inform those who matter in the case? So uh, in effect, what Mr. Obama, uh, Omani Obama is claiming is that the EC never answered those questions and they are demanding that the EC comes clean on it so that it will not create that fear and panic getting into the election because they want a free and fair election and they don't want anything to be shredded in secrecy. Uh, Mr. Nemako, did the Electoral Commission admit that they still have a missing voter verification device out there? Thank you, Evans. I think we shouldn't belabor the point. The EC informed political parties that this whole allegation of missing BVRVB is neither here nor there. That some computers, five computers, when they did their material check, they realized that we are missing. And they are reporting to the police. Can we please find out from the EC what the actual situation is? New Patriot Party, we are not the security over the EC's installation. Do you have to bother our heads? The EC says, We've made a report to the police. If NDC has information, they should volunteer to the police to assist with the investigation. Evans, I don't think we have to waste our energy on these issues. What for me was critical is that the EC tells us that on 30th of this month, they are running the by-election in a judicial constituency. The EC informed us that between 7th and 27th of May, they will be undertaking limited registration exercise. Yeah, we'll, come, we'll, come, we'll come to those. So, so please. We'll come to those specifics. However, yes. I, I understand that in this meeting, the EC recounted an incident in a Volta region during the district-level elections where the polling station was raided and everything was taken away, including a, a biometric verification device. Fact. Was the it something that you were told of? This issue has been reported to the Japan police station. Can we verify from the police whether the EC district officer stationed in that constituency has reported the missing issue to the police or not? And to what extent is the police undertaking? From, from what I understand, from this has been reported to the police, but the BVR in question, the BVD in question is yet to be retrieved. You see, this whole thing started with some confusion from the NDCs back here. They told us that seven BVRs of the EC is missing. Today, the NDC were there in the house. EC said, our BVR kits are intact, except that in five of them, the computers are missing. And we've reported it to the police. And the police is undertaking investigation. But, but there's a clear the difference NDC. between the five laptops and this biometric verification device in the voter region, which is missing. Is there not? Please. I'm saying that <laughs> we, the new patriotic party, we don't have the authority to provide security for the EC. Here is the case. The NDC says that through their investigation and intelligence, they are able to unravel these missing BVR BVDs. Let them volunteer information to the police to assist the police in the investigation. 
should we bother our heads over this too? The question, though, is, considering that the EC's earlier position was that they do not have on record any missing biometric verification device and that what is missing relates to five laptops, now we're hearing, indeed, one biometric verification device is indeed missing. Doesn't that raise concern for you as the MPP? So, Evans, if, if you know how the biometric verification registration kit works. It's a whole system. The computer is one component. For you to be able to assess the whole system, you should have a certain password. Without that, the computer alone out of it, that whole system becomes more bond. You can't use it. It's not kind of used for anything. There isn't any data on it. And so I'm surprised that the NDC, who claims to have intelligence on the missing kids, will not volunteer information to the police. Please, let's find out from the EC the actual situation. Let's find out where they reported in terms of the police station, and then we can then verify. And I, I really have uh, my doubt whether we should not discuss something else than, than to spend our whole energies on this issue. And this is a seven. Seven of the DVRs were missing. You see, can they say it's five computers and we've reported to the police. The other one you mentioned, the Norton issue, the Nanton issue, the Takwa, this is said. Their installations were vandalized, and out of that, some of their DVDs are missing. They are not able to trace them, but they've reported to the police. It is for all interested party stakeholders to assess. Other than that, I don't see where there should be a confusion. And, and when did this happen? So three EC installations, housing equipment. Had been Please, I think the, the EC will be in a position to provide the details on these things. Uh, but but they told but they told you they gave you the briefing today at the IPAC meeting. Please, is the NDC or my neighbor Amar, who says he has thirty five questions for EC? To yeah, but, but you're just confirming that at least three EC installations across the country had been raided, and three uh, well, of them have reported some the missing last equipment. The registration exercise they did in Takwa, they had a problem. The District level elections they conducted, they had an issue in Northton. In the case of Nanton, they couldn't conduct the exercise, and the nine or eight of the DVDs are with the police in Nanton. This is what the EC furnished us when we had the IPAC meeting. I think we can verify from there. Mm. I, I just been joined by Musa Fagbande, the NDC's Deputy General Secretary. Uh, Musa Fagbande, what was the account at the IPAC today as far as these biometric verification devices are concerned? <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, uh, I think that I'm listening to my, my colleague from the other side. And I really wish that we should have the conversation a bit. Um, we do know, as we speak today, that some machines that are used for registration or for voting are missing or tempered with an electoral commission. We are finished with the conversation. The rest of the issue is that let us subject the whole matter to scientific analysis. Let us ask questions, bordering on inventory, questions bordering on knowing the serial number of the machines that were missing. When did they detect that machines were missing? To the extent that it was disclosed to the public, so that the public can volunteer information until the matter came up at Parliament. Then they themselves gave us information of the number of machines that have been missing, only to come back and say that, oh, it wasn't seven, it's five, and that we are issuing a press statement to give you the assurance. And the assurance is that those machines cannot be functioning until they missing. What, what shows that the same that went to steal the machine 
will not sneak in into an electoral commission process. But, but most of the, man, the, the, the statement that the EC issued on the 20th of March made reference to five laptops, not yeah. biometric verification devices. Even they should go to circle and buy laptops and call them laptops. But as far as those machines were produced from the factory, they were not laptops. They are really the machines. And in like a, they are in a bag. And in that bag, it contains a, a laptop sort of affixed to it. It contains a printer. It contains a, a camera. They can't call it laptop. Even if they call it laptop, what it means is that the functionality of those machines have been tampered with. So therefore, it's important we go into inventory. It's important we do an audit. It's important we understand the fundamental issues. Plan statement and explanation does not suffice. The electoral commission's work has minimal application of discretion. And so therefore, when something happens, we only subject that to standards. And the standards are that do an inventory, do an audit. Police will determine the criminality of it. But we are dealing with the administrative, uh, uh, administrative inventory of these machines. What is difficult about it? That the electoral, uh, the MPT is now a PR or entity and saying that we should be volunteering information. Even the response from the MPP made the matter more complicated and more suspicious. I mean, how so? That, I mean, you, I've, I've heard of Mani Boama say it is based on your intelligence that this matter came to light and you asked the questions in Parliament. If you have intelligence, share it with the EC and the police. The we police are also going to participate in the election where machines are missing. How sure are they that those machines will not be in the hands of NDC to compromise the election? But it it appears, makes it but, very but, suspicious. Yeah, but, but Mustafa, it appears the end so you have what you call intelligence shared with the police. The, we don't have any responsibility of intelligence. They should stop mentioning the police. It has everything to do with administrative If by the time you get to Joy FM, three of your laptops are missing, there's a need for you to go and check because who was the last person before you left. You don't go to the police and leave it to the police and say that we should proceed to use the rest of the machines to conduct a nationwide registration exercise. But it is not done. But that was the point of today's emergency IPAC meeting, so that the EC yes. can give you answers and assurances. You say they, you're not they, assured. They, they came to the meeting without those answers. They, they didn't even have basic information up to date. They said they have to go and consult the technical officer. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine EC saying that they don't have information? They have to go and call. So how, how complicated is it for you to tell us that the DVT machine now I'm saying, we have done some post-check, some information. These are the serial numbers. So therefore, when you go to the police, you can find those serial numbers being in a complaint. How difficult it is. They should up the conversation. We are not raising emotional issues. They are not our girlfriends. They are a professional law, law established institution. That should be doing their work. Their work is to conduct a free and fair election. And that election must be credible. As it is today, without the inventory being conducted, any exercise of the electoral commission is compromised. And any exercise is subject to manipulation because five machines are in the hands of criminals and the electoral commission is not prepared to undertake scientific analysis and inventory into the listening machine. They have CCTV footage. Who did they see in it? Are they saying that the CCTV and the electoral commission were not function, functioning? Okay, so are they saying uh, that well, they don't have a storekeeper at the commission? You, you've, had, you've had time now with the EC to ask these questions. You're still not happy with the answers you got. What do you do now? Come again. You've asked your questions today at the emergency IPAC meeting. You say that you're still not happy with the answers you got. What next? These are very fatal questions bordering on the credibility of the Electoral Commission. And in their own interest, let them go and sleep on it and reflect. In fact, knowledge is not in one person's head. When they read the questions, our, our audience are also listening. Maybe they'll be advised and they will listen but know that. The way they are dealing with the issue is quite this one. And so let's get to the substance of the issue and deal with it. In the interest of the Commission's own integrity and credibility that has been put on the line. In the first place, we should not have a Commission that will fail to protect the questions. We should not have. Mm. We should not have a situation where 
still have been able to enter into the White House of the Electoral Commission to steal, knowing how important this match is, which is forgotten in the first place. Okay. Uh, Musa Vangmade, stay with me because I'm um, just having a, a challenge with your connection. I'm hopefully going to get you on a better line uh, because also today the Electoral Commission gave us a roadmap to the Jisubai election um, on when is the date? So the date is the 30th of April 2024, Evans. Okay. So according to the commission, they'll receive nominations from prospective candidates for the election of a member of parliament for the said constituency. The nominations will, re uh, will be received at the Ejusso District Office of the commission from the 16th April 2024 to 18th April 2024 between the hours of uh, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. on each day. The commissioners, um, those who are interested, uh, are required to download the nomination forms from the commissioner's website between 9th April 2024 and 8th, 18th April 2024. So uh, if you're a prospective candidate, you may personally have to deliver or cause to be delivered on your behalf by either the proposer or a seconder on your behalf. That is what the uh, EC is saying. So 30th of April exactly. is the date for the by-elections there. Uh, and I, I have uh, Paula Brampa, Mensa, he's a programs manager, CDD, also joining me right now uh, on this conversation. Uh, Musa Vagbande is still with me. Uh, but Paula Brampa, on the subject of the missing uh, BVDs, and the EC earlier explained that there were laptops, but we're getting some clarity today that uh, it may include BVDs. In fact, how should this be handled? I mean, for the NDC, this is sensitive enough to to jeopardize entire elections on December 7. Hello, Paul. Hello, good yes. evening. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I wonder if you had my question. Uh -huh. So it's it, it got to do with the BVD yes. that the NDC, the NDC uh, is still not happy today. with the answers given by the Electoral Commission. Yes, so uh, I'm, I'm happy... We are having uh, citizens who are up to the task of supporting every democratic process in the country. Yeah, so uh, uh, as I said, and I did indicate when this issue came up, and the NDC uh, uh, minority, uh, uh, minority caucus had a press statement. What I said was that it's better we support the justice delivery system to work. Uh, so I was asking the NDC to provide the evidence to uh, the police service to start investigation so that the people uh, who have stolen the five said machines could be arrested to support investigation. Uh, that is the only way we can unravel whatever it is that has happened actually. Uh, because the responses from the Electoral Commission uh, seem to uh, negate whatever the NDC is saying. Uh, and it would be better we have investigation uh, to see whether the claim of the NDC is actually true or what the MPP, uh, the uh, Electoral Commission is saying is the truth. So I would prefer whatever evidence the NDC has be given to the police to start investigations into the matter. Uh, and that's a fundamental question uh, that uh, I put to Musa Vagbandi on the subject as well. Uh, Musa Vagbandi says it's not their responsibility uh, to gather intelligence. But Mustafa, you will not disagree that you are an important stakeholder in this process and integrity of the process is as important to you as it is to everybody else in this country. Now, if you have the information, you should share it. Uh, uh, sure. It borders on Evans' authority of information and responsibility. The Electoral Commission has the utmost responsibility for the custody, protection, and preservation of those machines. And when we ask the question, even as we have right to information bill, you can always request any public institution and ask questions bordering on how it works. The public, just as any other ordinary person has the right to do, have asked the Electoral Commission, seven machines are missing. You didn't deny, you said five are missing. So if five are missing, giving a, give account for those five, and they're asking NDC to volunteer information, it is knowledge turned upside down. Let's go to the fundamentals. Electoral Commission is the sole body that has the responsibility to protect, preserve, and maintain those machines. They have come to admit that no, but five are missing. If the fact that they admitted five are missing and not seven, it shouldn't transfer responsibility to the NDC. We will not be in the position to assist. 
they should be in the position to undertake a public responsibility exercise. And that is to say that we are conducting an inventory to give you assurance as to how the things were missing, which of the machines have been tempered with or vandalized, which of them have been stolen, which of them are going to be deployed into the next exercise. So calling on the NDC to volunteer information, who says we are interested in the criminality of it? We are interested in the administration of those machines to the extent that it can jeopardize and compromise the integrity of the exercise. That is what the NDC is talking about. I mean, Paula Brampa, what about the Electoral Commission itself? What's your responsibility here? Because primarily, these equipment where we are talking about, they were, they were all in the custody of the EC at the time that it got missing, especially when we are not hearing that you have actual biometric verification devices that are also may be missing, not only in one place, but at least in three places that uh, we've heard from Evans de Marco earlier. able to come out to say that five machines are missing. Probably they have... Uh, the uh, NDC uh, didn't say that. The NDC said... ...can help the police to... Because there's a criminal aspect also to it. Apart from the electoral commission being accountable to, to its own uh, uh, administration, the, uh, there's also a criminal aspect of the whole thing. So uh, probably I was thinking because the NDC has been able to support us to tell us that because I only have known five machines are, get, are getting missing. It is the because of the agility of the NDC that some of these things have come up. So if they have any information, that's what I'm asking. I'm not saying it's the responsibility of the NDC to start the investigation. No. But if there are any information, if there's anything that can help us to unravel the criminal aspect of the whole thing, it's, we are all citizens. And as, as I said, we also support the system to function. So if there's any information that the NDC has, that it can help us to see which people did that, who did not handle his work well, then that will help us. But of course, the accountability and responsibility of the Electoral Commission uh, cannot be negated. Uh, Mr. McMahon, on, on another subject relating to... I mean, just a second, just a second. I mean, because of time, I need to get uh, some thoughts from you on the other big thing that happened at the emergency IPAC meeting, which is the setting of the date for the juicy by election. Is the NDC contesting? Yes, Evans, uh, we, the NDC is now going to... We went to Athenos two weeks into the election and won that. And so we are not worried at all. The Electoral Commission have set a date. Uh, leadership of the party will sit down and discuss. But I think that we place a lot of credence on this BVT political, you know, conversation than any other thing, because uh, the knowledge is being turned upside down. If you found somebody stealing, and you draw to the attention of the one they are stealing, that they are, they are taking something from him, does that mean that you should be the one providing information substantively to the missing items? No. EC should get to the bottom of the issues. We cannot be the ones leading investigation. Yeah. If okay, you, you have you, come you, to you admit make, publicly... Make, yes, you, that you, made, you made that point quite clearly earlier. So we should expect a, a, a sort of a primary in a juice for you. When is this? Yes, we have a parliamentary candidate in place. And so it is not... We, we are even ahead of the MPP. We already have a parliamentary candidate in place. The MPP is now battling. Up to nine people have unquestionably you know, filed to contest election of a deputy minister whose death they haven't investigated, a deputy minister around whose death there is a lot of suspicion, a deputy minister in whose one-week funeral the president's 80th well, birthday well, well, was... Well, well, Mr. Fagbande, uh, we will wait to see how that contest goes down, but we expect the NDC to fully... Your candidate will be in this race for this particular by-election, and you're also looking forward to the main one, I guess. We, that decision will be finalised when the national chairman and the general secretary are rightly seated. Okay, so just to clarify, you haven't taken a decision yet whether your candidate will be participating on the 30th of April by-election? We are yet to get to that decision, respectfully. Okay. Uh, that there is Musa Fagbande. He's a deputy general secretary of the NDC. Uh, Paula Brampa is a programs manager at the CDD. Uh, earlier, you had Evans Nemaku, who is the director of research and elections at the NPP. Uh, well, a lot to uh, digest on the particular subject of uh, the missing laptops and now missing biometric verification devices. Uh, the EC, we understand, may be issuing a statement to clarify what ex precisely happened in this IPAC meeting. As and when we get that, we'll bring that to you too. Ladies and gentlemen, Telecell is here! Telecell, connecting energies. Great news is here.
Kia. Batmat is here again. XXL Clarence Sale. Guaranteed savings. From now till the end of April, the big sale continues. Get discounts of up to 70% off sanitary words, light tiles, waterproofing, and all other product families. It's the year to get things done. Visit our showroom at the North Industrial Area next to the Winners Chapel, Ghana. Don't miss out. Batmat. Welcome home. Live on Joy, 99.7 FM here in Accra and Kumasi on Love, 99.5 FM. This is Newsnight. In the next 60 minutes. Wagadugu, mm. the capital of Burkina Faso, other than solar, is totally dependent on power from Ghana. If you give Burkina Faso solar bell, zero, it means they are in darkness. As the minority in parliament sounds the alarm bells about the economic and security complications following the abrupt curtailment of power to neighboring countries, we ask if the power situation in Ghana has since improved. We have details as Joy News Energy Desk checks reveal the financial impact on Gridco and VRA as it emerges that electricity export alone accounted for 32% of annual revenue made by the VRA in 2022. You want to stay for details of that. Also tonight, minority demands answers on $12 million paid to a contractor for Pualugu Dam for no work done, while another $2 million has been paid for the Tema Motorway for, again, no work done. We have more from Parliament where they are demanding a retrieval of the amount, investigation and prosecution of government officials who approved this particular payment. Also tonight, Baumia's campaign team takes on flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, who earlier described government's one student, one laptop policy as a political Expediency tonight, Baumia's team believes these comments were disrespectful and born out of bitterness. Complete total disrespect, and from no other person than a former president. If this is not double standards, if this is not the hypocrisy, then I leave the judgment to the good people of this country. We have details as the NPP demands John Ramani Mahama immediately desist from making comment about the free SHS if he does not have a campaign message. What is more worrying is the sheer bitterness unbelievably sheer bitterness. It is important that from today onwards, we see a complete seizure from the former president. And in business, World Bank highlights policy slippage and delays in reaching deal with external creditors as a major threat to Ghana's economic recovery. And much later, we have Champions League action and we'll be on the Medina Highway for today's fifth exhibition where we find the median of the roads used as transit points for waste collectors. The rubbish is not from the Togo people, it's not from Burkina Faso, it's not from Côte d'Ivoire, it's from the Ghanaians. So we will talk, 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 talk. We are in the same problem. We have that and more in tonight's edition of News Night. You want to join us with your thoughts and your comments via WhatsApp is 055-11-11997. I am MFR Pau. And my name is Evans Benson. Let's start with the uh, erratic power supply and the decision by government to reduce our exports to our neighboring countries. Tonight, Ghana continues to grapple with the erratic power supply in the country. We have had uh, to reduce drastically the amount of power being exported to our neighboring uh, countries. Now, Togo, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast and Benin have since been affected with reports of Wakadugu being worse hit by the decision. Well, this, according to sources, is part of measures adopted by government to address this erratic power supply in the country, as we've been talking about. Well, Chairman of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, Samuel Latachia, first hinted of the decision in this interview on PM Express. The President is concerned that we should have the good old days, seven years of power, and he's going to do everything to ensure that he and his finance minister who raise the requisite monies for us to have power. How much do we need? I, I don't have the numbers. You shouldn't worry about like a permanent situation of power outages. In fact, I am acutely aware that the president is working seriously hard and will drive everybody to, to do what is needful. Now we're hearing from the former power minister, Dr. Kovna Donko, who says the very survival of the voter authority and Greco is at stake if this decision is not reversed. It has both economic and security implications, mm -hmm. as well as even strategic implications. Let's take the strategic implication first. If I were Bokinabe, or I was in the leadership of Bokinabe, one, one I would say is supply from Ghana is unreliable. Why don't you look for alternate sources? And the alternative sources could be building more dams, 
many dams in Burkina. Mm -hmm. Remember, the voter takes a source outside Ghana. Right. So if they begin to build more dams, it will affect, it will affect, affect some more dams. our generation. So we must always have that in mind. That's the former power minister, Dr. Komna Donko. Now let's take a look at the financial implications of the decision and also find out whether the power situation has improved or seen some stability since we cut foreign export. My colleague, Kojo Brace, who heads the energy desk, is with me in the studio right now. Brace, you have a copy of the audited account of the VRA for 2021 and 2022 for their local and foreign power sales. Mm -hmm. What does that say? Well, Evans, now in 2020, in 2000, and uh, so 2022, the VRA sold a total of 12,645 gigawatt of power. Out of this, 20%, which is equivalent to 2,442, was sold to foreign customers and the remaining 80% to local customers. Now, the total revenue generated from the sales amounted to 5.4 billion cities. From the revenue, 32% came from foreign customers, which translates to some 1.75 billion. Domestic sales gave us 3.7 billion cities, but this is the kick. The most interesting thing about this whole issue is that we sold four times the power we sold domestically. You know, the, 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 the amount we sold to foreign customers, we, we sold about four of that domestically. But the 20% that we sold to foreign companies gave us almost half of what we earned from the power we sold locally. Because that's in dollars directly. You're earning that and you're paying you in dollars directly. When in the local market, mm -hmm. you're taking CDs, mm -hmm. which has been the challenge. You're taking that CD to go mm -hmm. and look for dollars and then buy you know, fuel, which you know has always it, posed it, a challenge. It, it could also mean the ability to, or inability to collect everything we sell. Locally. That, exactly. Now, among the foreign customers, we know that Sonobel Borga in Ouagadougou generated the highest revenue, um, amounting to some 885 million cities. Uh, now, in uh, the Communité Electric du Benin, followed with some 477 million cities from selling some 744, 43 gigawatt of electricity. The third highest revenue was 270 million cities, which came from Ivory Coast. And then we know that additionally, the Free Zones Company, Societe National Dele du Burkina, and Sunabo Yoga Mines generated some 92 million, 19 and 5.3 million respectively. So this is how much we are earning from what we are spoke. Okay, VRA is earning that. The question that the ECG and others mm. experts have asked is that if VRA is making this much, mm -hmm. how much, for example, are they contributing to the cash waterfall mechanisms? The question that we'll ask and get some answers to uh, when we speak to the uh, ranking member on the Energy Committee. But mm -hmm. let me ask you, you've mm -hmm. also been working your sources. Mm -hmm. What's the current power situation since this announcement was made by mm -hmm. uh, the chairman of the energy committee on pm express mm -hmm. that we've started reducing our exports mm -hmm. has that helped at all well uh, my sources tell me that you the right word will not be say improvement for example if we are shedding 600 megawatt of power the total megawatt that we do export is around 250 so if you subtract it from the 600, that it means that you have to now share between 350. So your situation is not, it is not looking as though it has improved. But uh, you should understand that if we stop exportation, it worsens the case for Great Co. and VRA. Because Great Co. Uh, needs the monies from Sonabel and all of these companies to pay for a loan they contracted between 2017 and 2018 to construct those lines to transport the power to them. Now, if you tell them to stop, where are they going to get the money to then pay off the, the, the loan? Again, those monies help them to build up capital to then pay for salaries and maintenance works. If you prevent that, where is the money coming from? They have always been telling us that the part they sell to G, uh, ECG, they have not been paying, which means that they do not have the money to undertake the maintenance works that they have to. So if you curtail exportation, you hurt Gritco and VRA. Now, VRA's case is even worse because VRA solely has a chunk of the monies that they have coming from, you know, exportation. So if you ask them to curtail, it means that you're worsening the case of, uh, the case of uh, VRA. That is w how the situation is looking like. So, so that, that is the, the grim nature. So even though we are curtailing, uh, 250 megawatt of power from export, we are still having to shed between 350 megawatt and more because the amount that you have to shed depends on what happens on, on a daily basis. 
Well, so that's uh, the information we are picking up, at least uh, from the Iron Energy Desk, head of Iron Energy Desk, um, Samuel Kujibri, giving us all the details. But what exactly um, is uh, the past situation uh, where you are? We've been talking about our Doomsaw Diaries. We definitely will be joined shortly by the ranking member on the Energy Committee in Parliament. We've been hearing from former power minister talking about the implications, both economically um, on and security issues and concerns also on this. But let's focus on health now. Um, and tonight, the Ministry of Health has commenced engagement with the Ghana Revenue Authority, Customs and the Health Ministry to expedite action in clearing the locked up essential medical supplies locked up at the Tema port. The consignment procured uh, for Ghana by the Global Fund, including HIV antiretroviral drugs, tuberculosis cartridges, we have malaria test kits, bed nets and other consumables, all worth, guess what, $48 million have all been stacked at the uh, Kutuka International Airport since May 2023 due to the government's failure to pay tax charges. The delay in clearance has today triggered a reaction uh, from donors. That's the Global Fund who threatened suspension of shipment of essential medical supplies to Ghana. But there's a fresh development on the situation now because uh, the health ministry, the finance ministry, government in general is coming through with some measures on this and uh, James Aveji um, has been monitoring this. He joins me in studio with details of that. Let's start with the number of containers left to be cleared according to the ministry. Yes, I'm afraid. So the ministry says out of the 435 containers, the, it has been able to successfully and expedi expeditiously cleared 253 from the port though the support of government uh, uh, through the support of government with some 182 containers remaining to be cleared and and what is the ministry doing exactly to clear these supplies and is there any deadline they've given us it says it has initiated a process of extensive engagement with the management of the Ghana Revenue Authority, the Customs, Exercise and Preventive Services, SEPs, as well as uh, led by the Commissioner General, Ms. Julia Essiem, and officials of the Ministry of Finance uh, uh, and the Country Coordinating Mechanism of the Global Fund to fight HIV AIDS and other stakeholders to make sure that these containers, uh, 182, are cleared immediately. They have set a deadline of Friday, this Friday, April 20. April 12, 2024, mm. to get that done. And there have been um, some concerns about how to deal with future, future deliveries. Does the statement address that? Yes, MFA. So it says, furthermore, we wish uh, to reassure our stakeholders and the general public that the challenges associated uh, with the clearing of Ministry of Health, Medicines, and other commodities from the Tema port and other points of entry have been conclusively and completely resolved by the government of Ghana. And so that's the assurance that moving forward, any of such products that comes into the country, they have put in mechanisms to make sure that it is cleared on time and we do not expect to see what we have seen over the period. Okay. Mm. That's James Aveji with details of uh, that statement from the health ministry. Uh, you know, the major, major concern, MFR Power, is that uh, the drugs that are currently, uh, you know, currently held up by the ports will expire. That's the main concern of the Global Fund. Cecilia Lodonusenu is Executive Director of Hope uh, for Future Generations and elected board member of the Global Fund. The issue is if you have a lot of containers with very sensitive drugs, exposed they are outside there do you still need to ship more if the one there is not cleared i think that is where the issue is so global fund is also looking at it they have a whole team procurement team that is also monitoring the whole world that their investments go and so until ghana cleared this it will be difficult to add and my suggestion is that as a country we should really work together and ensure that access to these drugs are very, very available, especially at the sub-national level. And people should be responsible and take them and play their role very well. You know, we cannot wait for this to continue because this is the first time we had this for a long time at the port. Normally we have, I mean, some of them, but it doesn't, it has never taken so long. And that is where the question is, what is very special about this that we are unable to claim? I mean, you can expose very sensitive drugs under the sun. Of course, it, will, it may affect the efficacy 
for the expiry date, yesterday we heard that most of them will be expiring in 2025. But I think 2025 is just around the corner because by the time they clear these drugs, move them to the central medical store, store share it with the regions, then sending it to the district, sub-district, and then to the user. It can take six months, seven months. And so that is where our worry is. Then we end up burning and destroying expired drugs because of our inaction and not doing what it is. And millions of, over $40 million, which is a problem. I want to bring in the spokesperson uh, for the health ministry, Isaac Ofer, joins us right now. Mr. Ofer, thanks for your time here on News Night. When are we clearing these drugs? Yes, yeah, so good evening, Evans, and good evening to your cherished uh, listeners. Um, as a ministry, like we indicated in our statements, um, issues surrounding the clearance of those drugs at the port have been resolved. And we, we are not only thinking about this particular one, but we are looking at the future so that any drugs that come after this particular lockup uh, med- medicines at the port will not be facing such challenges that we face with this particular uh, yeah, commodity. I, I appreciate now, the future, but I, I want to understand year, first. For the year 2023, we've received 453 containers. And we've cleared 253, leaving uh, 182, as we indicated in our report. So it's not like the ministry is not be clearing the goose and all the so 400. The 182, are, when are you clearing them? We clear them before Friday. Between t- today and Friday, we should clear those drugs from the port. What really held you up? You know, there have been these challenges regarding the charges and uh, some uh, items that are attached to the commodities as and when they arrived. And so if we don't deal with it once and for all, what it means is that every year that we receive such commodities from donors, it means that we will still have to go and pay. And this is government to government test. You are paying a government to receive by, receive by the government, and the drugs are also, are also going to be used by government. So we need to come to a complete or a decisive conclusion so that rules are made to waive some form of passes or charges on such commodities. This is what we have done break down the neck, and now we can assure the general public that all drugs that comes to us, being a donor or a domestic purchase, we're, going to, we're not going to face such challenges anymore. And like I said, yesterday, even yesterday, we received some items from uh, uh, Global Fund, which were shipped to us. We still have notifications assuring us of the drugs coming back to Ghana at every point in time as agreed upon. Now, we are talking also about the expiring dates that um, have been mentioned and all that. Over the years, carrying goods from both the port is not only the Ministry of Health. We go with Food and Drugs Board as well. Who will take the medications to ensure that what we are taking out and what we are sending to them is something that will be very consumable to us as a nation. I don't know where I may be tomorrow. Then that I happen to be a patient in a ward tomorrow and the drugs are not... In, of good standard. It's going to affect me as well. So we take all those things into consideration. They're going to check them to assess them to see whether these drugs are very effective or not. So yeah. the issue of expiring date, we've been receiving drugs all over. Yeah, but, but the, 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 the issue about the, the drugs expiring, the issue about the, the drugs care. expiring is of fair. It only came up because of the inordinate delay that this particular batch experienced. And as you've just explained, it's primarily because of the charges that had to be paid you're saying that you now have an arrangement where the drugs that are donated to you will be exempt from duties? We have we come to a, a common agreement, and we expect that uh, Ministry of Finance and uh, Ghana Revenue Authority will also come out with a statement. Yesterday, the commissioner issued a statement indicating some of the directives uh, or the issues that have been cleared out. We so are so just, just clarify, so what is the arrangement? That all drugs donated to Ghana will not attract duties at the ports. Is that what it is? Yeah, it is. It, this particular answer will be within the rhythm of the commissioner to issue because after the meeting, all of us have roles to play as to what each of us represents. We are sure that all drugs that are coming to us from the ministry, we would be able to take them off the port 
without any further delay. Okay, thank you very much. That's there is a spokesperson for the health ministry. Thankfully, we can speak to Dr. Treme uh, who is the Director General of the AIDS Commission. Uh, Doc, thanks for your time here on News Night. I'm just curious, this delay, how has it affected our ability, your ability, to dispatch antiretroviral drugs to those who need it in the quantities they, they need it in? Hello, Dr. Treme. Hello, Dr. Trevor. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Great. Uh, Evans, yes. good evening. Great to have you. I'm just curious to inquire. Uh, this challenge that you've had with the drugs donated by the Global Fund that has been stacked at the ports, how has it affected your ability to, to give the drugs to those who need it in Ghana? Well, this, this has been a, a recurring situation. Why? So I I never can understand because it's not supposed to happen the way we've been experiencing, and so uh, it is quite heartwarming that the new Commissioner General of the of the GRA has you know taken upon herself, and I know. She is acting on the instructions of the Minister for Health, uh, Finance, who is taking this matter very seriously and will want to see the end of it. Uh, clarify for me the drugs in question that have been stuck at the ports. What's the status when it comes to its expiry or otherwise? What do you know? Uh, I don't have the in detail of, of such information. But we know that some of them, especially the malaria uh, products, have been there for a very long time, some almost a, a year ago. And if they have, you know, short shelf life, then obviously it can uh, be expired. But we pray and hope that uh, that is not the situation. Do you have a shortage of ARVs in Ghana? Not at the moment. Are you rationing any? Not at the moment. Thank you very much. And that day is the the head, the director general of the AIDS Commission, uh, speaking to us about the situation at the ports with the drugs that donated to Ghana by the Global Fund but uh, left at the port for so long. Well, let's bring in um, the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee in Parliament, taking us back to our earlier story about the power situation in Ghana and also the fact that the Energy Desk checks are revealing uh, the impact of the curtailment of export of power to our neighboring countries, up to 32% uh, revenue um, that were made by VRA uh, from exports. But really, has the power situation improved um, since that curtailment? And Mr. Jinapo joins us on the line. We are grateful for your time. So from where you sit, at least, uh, what do we know as the power situation improved? Is there some stability as we speak? Hello, Mr. Jinapo. Hello. Thank you. So I was asking about uh, whether there's been some stability since the curtailment. Well, a lot has been said about our export when indeed we needed more locally and that has happened now. Has there been some stability as we speak? No, no, no. no. As we speak to you, I'm in Tamale and you can check from your correspondent in Tamale. There's massive load shedding in the whole of Tamale, and people are using generator as we speak. So I can confirm to you that, based on my checks as well, we still do not have adequate supply of power to meet the country's demand, even after curtailing supply of power to our neighboring countries. But the understanding we got was that once we curtail the export to our neighboring countries, we should have some stability in the system. What then happened? First of all, even if you curtail exports, what you'll be doing is that you'll be curtailing about 300 or 350 megawatts. The shortfall is over 600 megawatts. And so curtailing of exports would not be enough to meet our national demand. All that will do is that it will reduce the deficit, but you still have a deficit of about 300 megawatts. And that is quite a quantum when it comes to our power generation and demand. So clearly... The tailing of effort doesn't even resolve the problem. Well, it looks like there's no end in sight in the near future, is there? Pardon? I was asking if there's a, an, an end in sight in the near future. Well, the end in sight is very clear. As soon as government is able to mobilize money to procure fuel, 
and that is liquid fuel. We are talking of heavy fuel oil, distillate fuel. The problem will be over. The plants are available when we engage the industry players. They confirm that we have available capacity. We have dependable capacity. All we need is to procure fuel. And when government is able to help them procure fuel, this erratic power supply, otherwise known as Jumso in our local parlance, will be a thing of the past. It's a financial challenge. That is just it. And I think that the president should show leadership by helping to raise some funding and financing to procure the needed fuel. We're grateful. That's um, John Ginapo, ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee in Parliament. You've been hearing a former power minister on this as well. And uh, the Energy Desk will bring you more uh, details of it as well on um, the Joy News uh, channel, Joy Prime at 7, and also more on myjoyonline.com. It's all live your news tonight. It's on Joy 99.7 FM. And we were on the subject of health and MFR power. I'm pretty sure you know that the NHI has been facing some challenges. This year, we rolled out a series that looked at the challenges that the NHI is currently facing. Uh, we had from patients who are struggling just to... We dubbed, uh, we dubbed it sick hospitals. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then this is something that just focused exclusively on the NHI as itself. Now we're hearing that there have been some reforms that are yet to be introduced. And this includes the introduction of an automatic adjustment formula to address the gap between tariffs and the actual market value of goods and services. The CEO of the National Health Insurance Authority, Dr. Da Costa Boaje, has assured Ghanaians that illegal charges at health provider sites, which have been one of the biggest challenges we discovered uh, in our series, will soon be eliminated. Now, speaking in a yet to be aired interview, on Upfront with Raymond Aqua, he elaborated that the current review of the medicines list and the tariffs aims to align uh, with the economic realities, enabling sanctions against providers who violate this particular policy. The challenge is the tariffs are inadequate. Very low. Very low. They, they are telling me that, please, review the tariffs. And I, when I started, I told you that there is a team, the Strategic Purchasing Unit, is now reviewing the tariffs with all the stakeholders. Now, I plan, by my experience, to stop co-payments. Really? It's a bold statement. I'm telling you, I plan, by my experience, to stop co-payment. How would I do this? I will achieve this by, obviously, after the tariff review, okay? After the tariff review, the prices will go up. I will seek approval from Parliament to make sure that we do what we call the automatic price adjustments. We tie it to inflation. So, in the UK, that's what we do. So there is a committee that will be set up. Immediately that the prices go up, the committee will set up. And, and bear in mind, we can cover this within our allocation formula because always you can have 30% excess in terms of what you have planned. This year we do have it. So if I guarantee the automatic price adjustment like we do in the fuel field, okay? Now the problem will be that in Ghana here, things do not go down. <laughs> you see, because people will, that, that's what, you see, so if providers, if providers, are actually getting what they want, the prices that they, 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 they get it, I believe that then it will be morally not right for them to be charging our clients under the 95% of what we cover. The Chief Executive of the National Health Insurance Authority, Dr. Da Costa Abwaji. You're still listening to News Night here on Joy 99.7 FM in Accra. In Kumasi, we are on Love 99.5 FM affiliates across Ghana's 16 regions. Still to come, Baumia's campaign team takes on flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, who earlier described government's one student, one laptop policy as political expediency. Tonight, Baumia's team believes these comments are disrespectful and born out of bitterness. Complete total disrespect, and from no other person than a former president. If this is not double standards, if this is not the hypocrisy, then I leave the judgment to the good people of this country. We have details of that after business. George Riafi is here. Hello, George. Hi, Emifa. And uh, coming up in business, we'll be telling you what the World Bank is highlighting in terms of the major risk to Ghana's economic recovery. We'll be giving you more details on that one. And Ghana signs agreement to Benin to aid mobile roaming services from July 1 this year. As the National Communications Authority highlights the numerous economic benefits to the country. The Business News on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business. Kingdom Books and Stationery, Sintestanks, and Pepsodent, Herbal, and Chaco.
want to eat, just Momo it. Tired of the long queues in the supermarket? Pay with Momo. When you really want that beautiful new blouse, just Momo it. When you want to get a trim and get fresh to impress you know who, just Momo it. When you need to pay your utility bills and domestic staff, Shani Momo. When you want to send love to the family back home, send some Momo. Join the millions of MTN Momo users all over Ghana and live life the brighter way. So just Momo it. MTN. Son, we are so proud of you for setting up this hospital. I really love those hospital beds and waiting chairs. By the way, did you import them? No, Dad, I didn't. I actually got them from Kindle Books and Stationery right here in Ghana. Wow. We also bought our office supplies, safes, executive desks and chairs from Kingdom, and they gave us expert advice on how to set up our office. Guys, that makes three of us. I also got our sofa and bedroom sets, plus our dining hall furniture for our new home from Kingdom. Wow, Mom, that makes four of us. I usually get my stationery items from Kingdom. Kingdom. And my teacher also mentioned that our classroom furniture was provided by Kingdom. So there you have it. Whenever you're thinking about setting up an office or acquiring furniture for your home, etc., Kingdom Books and Stationery should be your first point of call. With over 14 years' experience in the industry, we stock and supply a wide variety of globally sourced office and home furniture, stationery, and equipment. Visit our head office, Osu Akwaje, or our office near the Osu Stadium. We're also in Tema Community One, opposite Olam SHF, Kumase K and USD campus. You see. Cape Coast and now at the Marina Mall Airport City or call us 0302 764101 764209 or 762792 visit our website www.kingdomgh.com Water is needed all day all night so remember Syntex Tank all day all night 7 years warranty select any color for free in no crack in no despoil. Call a cra on 0244-335-168. Kumasi 0505-555-666. Syntex Tank. A strong, a tough. Water is needed all day, all night. So, remember Syntex Tank all day, all night. Seven years warranty. Select any color for free. In no de crack, in no de spoil. Call a cra on 0244 335 168. Kumasi 0505 555 666. Syntex Tank. A strong, a tough. There is time for everything, including exclusive breastfeeding by mothers. Which starts within the first 30 minutes baby is born till the time the child is six months old. Grandma. Grandpa. Husbands. Let's all come on board Good Life and insist that our child takes only breast milk for the first six months. No food. No, no water. water. No gripe water. Breast milk has all the nutrients the child needs to grow strong and healthy. So I ask. How, How is, is your good life? life? Remember that exclusive breastfeeding for six months is best for baby. And good growth starts with right nutrition at birth. Good life. Live it well. It's an everyday thing. Good life from Ghana Health Service and Partners. With support from USAID. Auntie Araba. Hey, Boga, how are you doing today? I want to buy Pepsodent Cavity Fighter, but I don't have enough money. So what are you going to do? Can you give me the big size? You know, as for me, I'll pay the balance later. Today, no credit. Oh. I haven't sold much this morning. If you don't have enough money for the big size, why don't you try the 120 gram pack? There's a 120 gram pack? Introducing the new Pepsodent Cavity Fighter in 120 gram pack size. More affordable and convenient. Get yours today from any supermarket near you. Every smile matters. This advert is FDA approved. Hello, my name is Mami Ikuya, an entrepreneur and a mother of two. My work keeps me busy most of the time and sometimes it takes me away from my family. But the safety and health of my family is very important to me. As a working mother, I cannot afford to take any chances when it comes to matters of health. That is why I signed up for a family health care plan from Equity Health Insurance. My family and I have access to over 700 hospitals, clinics, opticians, dentists, pharmacies and diagnostic centers across the length and breadth of Ghana. With Equity health insurance, I no longer have to worry about medical bills. Anytime a member of my family visits a hospital, Equity Health Insurance has got my family and I covered. What about you? Who has got you covered? 
call Equity Health Insurance on 050-660-7910 and talk to them about your family health needs now. Visit equityhealthinsurance.com for more information. Equity Health Insurance, here for you. You're welcome back to Business on News Nights. Now, World Bank has noted that government's failure to commit to fiscal discipline, especially in election year, may pose a major threat to the country's economic recovery. The bank, in its latest economic report for Africa, affirmed that Ghana is on that path to firmly stabilize its economy. Dr. Andrew de Belen is the chief economist at the World Bank and has been speaking to Joy Business from Washington, D.C., USA. Domestic threats are the ones I've just mentioned, right? The real fear of policy slippage, okay? That, that's not a trivial issue. And I think, I hope that, you know, the government of Ghana will remain uh, focused on, on, on bringing stability back um, to the macro economy. You know, the failure to come through with the reforms Right, such as we've talked about bringing inflation down for you know, and then uh, and then making sure that they met revenue and spending targets that they have committed to in order to be able to uh, um, meet that. Um, so 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 that's that's a, that's a, that's the that's the risk at the domestic level. At the international level, there is the risk that there's going to be underperformance of the economies of major trading partners, and that will weigh down on economic activity. So so that's one possibility. Well, the other possibility is the failure to conclude the agreement with the official and private external credit amount committees, right? So that also will 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 create a lot of risks um, and, and you know, will will undermine confidence and, and therefore uh, depress investments from flowing into the country. And then, you know, you, you never know, but there could be major disruption to trade and global supply chains for many ongoing geopolitical tensions. Chief Economist at the World Bank, Dr. Andrew Devlin, speaking to Joy Business from Washington, D.C., USA. Now, Ghana has an agreement with Benin to aid mobile roaming services between the two countries from July 1, 2024. The pact will help implement regulations on roaming for mobile communications within the ECOWAS region. So what will be the impact of this on Ghana's economy and mobile subscribers, Professor Ezra, Oseye Boabwating, the Deputy Director General of the National Communications Authority. So the, the impact is uh, the economic, of, of course, the economic benefit to the citizens of both nations. So hitherto, before the ECOWAS Free Roaming Initiative, you went to Benin or Togo or La Côte d'Ivoire, then you will pay high charges for roaming. But with this initiative, means that it, you pay like a local call. And when you receive the call, you do not have to pay. Like you're receiving the call as a local within uh, that particular visiting country. So you do not have to pay like a typical uh, roaming where you even pay for receiving calls. So those are typical impacts. And then it's going to also encourage um, maybe kind of trade. There, there are numerous benefits uh, that accrue from any telecommunication service uh, provision. So those those are typical impacts that we expect. Professor Isa Ose Yeboa the Deputy Director General at the National Communications Authority. Bank of Ghana Governor Dr. Ernest Addison is insisting that the economy is showing signs of stability based on reforms undertaken by a government supported by his donors. Speaking at the Public Accounts Committee, the governor maintained that he believes that things will normalize soon. Things are improving. Our foreign exchange reserve levels are improving. Recently, the World Bank, thanks to the members of parliament, approved a facility. So we have had uh, $300 million added to our reserves. All of that, you know, strengthens our position uh, to support you in executing these types of projects. So rest assured that so long as the economy continues on the path that we are on, we should be able to help you deliver. And that is the governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, answering questions from parliamentarians when he appeared before the Public Accounts Committee. Now, Deputy 
Minister of Transport, Hassan Tampoli, has dismissed projections that fuel prices could soon reach 17 uh, cities uh, in the coming weeks. The Chamber of Petroleum Consumers had maintained that prices of petroleum products could reach that level very soon. But speaking in an interview with Joy Business, Ms. Hassan Tampoli maintained that the current pricing structure and the external factors doesn't support this projection. I, I don't know where this fuel prices are going through the roof is coming from. Don't forget, in this country, fuel prices have gone way up to 23 Ghana cities before. Now, at the time that the fuel prices were 23 Ghana cities, the lorry fares were even lower than they are right. So I'm not sure whether there is need to panic about increase in lorry fares. This current pricing window, petrol was supposed to go up by about 3% and diesel was for about 1%. So I'm not sure there is need to panic. And the price of petroleum product is done transparently. You can check it out on your own. And you can compare with Ghana, Togo, Nigeria, La Côte d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, and you recognize that ours is not the highest, by far one of the least. Hassan Tampoli is the Deputy Minister of uh, Transport. And that's all for Business on Newsnight. Back to you, MFA and Evans. Thank you very much, George. It's time for filth exhibition here on Newsnight. And where are we going? We're going to Medina. Uh, and that's uh, literally, it used to be my hood. <laughs> I drive by that area all the time on my way home. And the median of the roads there, if you have driven by the Medina market, the Zungu Junction area, you see what we're about to describe for you. Should ideally be a green space. And in fact, the former Greater Accra Regional Minister tried it. In fact, he, he planted these nice trees in the media and made the place very beautiful and then erected his fence uh, wall just to prevent people from trampling on, on the green grass there. Landscaping flowers. Flowers are still there now. They're very dry now, looking pretty <laughs> ugly. Trees, a beautiful plant. That's, that's what the plan was at the start, right? But that is not the case on the Medina Highway right now. Looking dry and dusty. These medians are now being used as transit spot for waste collectors. They just get into MFS Hope, for example. They just dump in there and then go away. In a field exhibition today, Hanodami tells us what she saw when she drove on that particular stretch. One, two, three, four, and five. That's the number of heaps of rubbish on display in between the highways on the Madena Zungo stretch Adela in Quantanan district in the national capital. Pedestrians call this an eyesore, especially for a city which yearns to be the cleanest in Africa. It's, it's very, 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 very abhorrent. They have to charge those who are around to. Yeah, you are sitting here, sir, and you, after that, you go and put the garbage here. It's not nice. Those, those should change their attitude. Those who make, gather, and dump the rubbish in between the roads say, it is the assembly which has not been responsible in collecting the rubbish. The waste collectors don't come to pick the rubbish, and so this place is always filthy and smelling. The entire stretch is filled with rubbish. Why? This leads to cholera and malaria. Government should pay the collectors so they can do their work. I dare ask, is this the country we say will be the cleanest in Africa soon? Also contesting are some of the traders who sell along the highway and are being blamed for generating such filth and not dumping them in designated bins. Why else? 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 When we close from work, we collect all the rubbish we make. We always sweep our working areas, especially when we close. And the waste collectors come for the rubbish every morning. But today, they are late. Fed up with a constant spectacle of rubbish littered all over the stretch. 
this regular user of the road proposes a solution. You see, the rubbish is not from the Togo people, it's not from Burkina Faso, it's not from Côte d'Ivoire, it's from the Guineans. The ordinary man who is walking on the streets, you see, you come and pick it today, tomorrow when you come, you come and meet it again. So now what are you going to do? So this one, no, me, I don't put blame on the uh, Zoom Lion because the Zoom Lion, now no place they're supposed to put the, uh, the, the dustbins. So they will tell the people, you put it on the middle of the road, so after uh, in, in another day they will come and pick it. So we will talk, 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 talk. Government will go, government will come, government will go, government will come. We are in the same problem. Frustrated about the regular sight of rubbish, this road user also struggles to recommend to join us. A lasting solution, he believes, would help keep the city clean. I don't know, I don't know. We too, we are the cause, you see. So at least the assembly to uh, at least give us some, a lot of these beans, rubbish beans, so that uh, if anything, we can dump inside, instead of putting it on the ground. From Medina here in Accra, I am Hannah Odami for joining us. Well, if you've driven by that area tonight and you've seen the filth we've just been talking about, just take a photo, take a video and share with us. 55 or hit us up on Twitter or X Spaces mm -hmm. or X. <laughs> We're going to have a conversation on X Spaces on filth exhibition pretty shortly. And then also, of course, go to YouTube, Facebook and share with us uh, those pictures and just tag us so we can see them. Or even on TikTok. Even on TikTok, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. please do so. Uh, mm -hmm. Joy 99.7 or Joy News. Well, let's do some of your messages um, that you've sent in. And I have this one from Dawinya. He didn't add a name, but he says, as we speak, my light has been out for four hours now. No improvement, no show. And there's this one also from Motu in Abeka. says it's very irresponsible to shift the responsibility of investigation into the loss of the uh, EC machines to NDC. Let's get serious as a people and put pressure on state institutions to act responsibly. Um, so there's an issue we've been talking about on Top Story after that IPAC, emergency IPAC meeting uh, today. And and this one from Kwesi in Kaswa says the supervisor of the repairs of the motorway and the contractor should be made to pay back the money uh, paid to the contractor for no work done. The contractor and supervisor of the dam must also pay back the money uh, for no work done. So there's a story we are get, we're about to get into. And we have this one from Nana Ikuyamua Boating Ablikuma Central says the government should, as a matter of urgency, restore the power supply to our neighboring countries. I'm not sure the curtailment of power supply to them is the cause of our current power challenges and that's uh, from Nana Ikuyamua Boating and um, some of your messages that you've sent in so far. Well the minority in parliament they're demanding answers from government which has paid more than a hundred million Ghana CDs for two projects with no work done. The governor of the central bank Dr. Ernest Addison confirmed to the public accounts committee of parliament on Monday that 12 million dollars have so far been paid to a contractor for the Polugu dam and another 2 million dollars for the Tama motorway extension project the minority however insists that despite these payments no work has been done to in fact ensure that we have value for money members of the committee and member of the committee and MP for Buem I told your news it is unconscionable for government to waste public resources in this manner and turn around to blame COVID-19 for the economic crisis. Almost $12 million, that's about $11,949,088 uh, dollars and six cents have been paid to Power China for the Pualugu irrigation project. When actually when you visit the site there, no work. Why would we continue spending our money in such a manner and this was done in 2021 again another payment that was done was also to uh, ms motor angels in the name of what the Momoto way extension project motor angels had no contracts with the government of ghana at least for that i know that they had no valid contract with the government of ghana and they did no work on the motorway because at least for me i'm a tema person. So it's a route I apply all through. So how and why did we pay money 
to a company that have done no work whatsoever for government of Ghana. Then we turn around and be blaming COVID and be blaming Russia and Ukraine. How did COVID force us to make this payment? So clearly, this government has a lot of questions to, to answer. Well, NDC MPs want government to retrieve the monies paid to the two contractors as no work has been done, they claim. They also want an investigation and prosecution of public officers who approve the payments. Back to somebody and the person did not execute the job and you have made payments, the right thing to do is to take back. So in the case of the Pualugu uh, project, multi-purpose project, where the president and the vice president, Mahmoud Baumia, were there, and they deceived the people, they lined them up, wasted our monies to fly up there and drove in all the vehicles to the point, and did all the propaganda that they want to do about the project, and ended up giving away this money to they should be working their way to get this money back to the coffers. That is true. But for the second one, where there exists no contract, truly persons who provided certificates for this payment, or if they did not provide certificates for the payment, but Bank of Ghana went ahead to pay, then people must be answering. Is there a case of causing financial loss to the state? Well, worse than causing financial loss to the state. Because clearly the people had no contract. If you remember uh, the incident of uh, Alfred Woyome and his company, for them even, they got some work done. But the basis upon which what happened happened was that they said that whole contract was not submitted to parliament for ratification. And it was considered as international contract. In this case, no work has been done. No contract existed, but it has been made. That's the Boem MP. Kofi Adams taking us to election headquarters now. And your election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosol Clean Through All in Full Quantity, SIMA, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, SIMA, AICPA and SIMA together as the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants and the German Ozone Medical Center, Alternative Therapy, Dental, Wellness and Beauty. And tonight, Baumia's campaign team are taking on flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, who earlier described government's one tablet or one student, one tablet policy as political expediency. The former president addressing students at the Wisconsin University in Accra said government initiated this policy to convince the students who are turning 18 to vote for the NPP in the December polls. Tonight, Baumia's team believe these comments are disrespectful and born out of bitterness. We'll hear from the team, but first, let's hear from John Dramani Mahama. Bring a new curriculum. The children have no textbooks in basic school for the last four years. And you think that giving pre-tertiary students laptops, uh, uh, tablets, is more important. Of course, everybody knows the political expediency. The pre-tertiary students are going to register in May because they will, some of them would be coming 18 years and above. Some are 18 already, and they are going to be the ones voting. So this is a gift to entice them to vote for the, uh, the current government. Otherwise, if you are using 1.3 billion cities to give pre-tertiary students laptop, our priority would have been different. There are other things begging for funding in our educational system than, than, than those laptops. But it's a bribe for them to vote for this government. But, I mean, the children do not exist in isolation. They live in households and families. Some of them parents are those who were working in the banking sector that you cruelly closed nine indigenous banks and threw them all out onto the street. Now we can listen to the response of the, the director of communications of the Baumia campaign team, Miracle Zabwaj, who is questioning the rationale for the consistent attacks by John Mahama. Complete total disrespect and from no other person than a former president who should not who should know better to be running down our young children and calling them names? Till this moment, ladies and gentlemen, the entire country is in shock as to how the incompetent, corrupt, and failed former president could unashamedly attempt to denigrate the provision of tablets for senior high school students. 
that one too, which would quicken the transformation processes of our senior high school education into the digital area and for them to be ready for the world ahead of them. The rollout of one student, one tablet policy may have been hard to take for the NDC and the former president. Of course, for them, it's a big hit because they failed to deliver on the same promise they made in his 2016 State of the Nation address. Now, the hypocrisy. Isn't it unfortunate that the failed former president and the NDC would, in the full blown of a hypocritical parade, come to display their bitterness towards a policy and especially its beneficiaries who are all Ghanaians of this country? The incompetent former president, after promising to roll out and distribute tablets across this country and failing woefully to implement this promise, comes to question the priority of government to do the exact thing that he promised some seven years, eight years ago, and could not deliver. If this is not double standards, if this is not the hypocrisy, then I leave the judgment to the good people of this country. Well, uh, Miracle Sabwaji has also uh, called for an immediate halt by John Mahama in his deliberate attacks against the free SHS policy. What is more worrying is the sheer bitterness, unbelievably sheer bitterness, and the constant attacks that the former president met on these, constantly meting out on these free SHS beneficiaries, apparently for no reason. The former president needs to do away with this bitterness against the beneficiaries of free senior high school because clearly they cannot be blamed for his failure as a president. Neither can the two occasions that he lost his elections or was rejected by the people of Ghana be blamed on these senior high school beneficiaries. It is important that from today onwards, we see a complete seizure from the former president in the manner in which he goes about attacking the free senior high school beneficiaries. That's Miracles of Wages, Communications Director for the Baumia campaign team. And if I remember that controversy that erupted uh, on the back of that expedited hearing of the case uh, involving uh, this is the Roxin Dafiame Pomata, uh, and how it was related to, directly to the anti gay bill. Well, as we know now, the Speaker of Parliament also uh, sent a request to the Chief Justice for expedited hearing. Roxin Dafiame has been speaking now today, uh, and we know. Uh, we know uh, that uh, the the court, the Accra High Court, has granted his application for abridgment of time in the case the MP seeking to compel President Akufado to receive the anti-LGBTQ bill passed by Parliament. And he's been uh, speaking about it today uh, with some strong words for the Attorney General. Um, you have an Attorney General who, in one case, wants a matter to be heard the next day, even though it's not it's premature and yet we we'll come to court and say that he's not prepared he hasn't filed any affidavit in opposition we want to argue the matter strictly on law but we we'll ask for a date I, I mean the 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 irony is so staggering but here we are but i i prefer this to going to may or june you know this you know that we are just back from easter so the courts are very um, very busy with uh, part heads. So for a fresh matter like this to receive priority from the bench, uh, it's uh, refreshing. So I'm very happy that come the 18th, a uh, decision will be made. Uh, whether in our favor or not, um, I, I believe that uh, you, you have exhibited commitment in this matter. So that's Roxanne Nelson, the farmer, for the interacting with Kweku Asante. And that's how we wrap up um, News Night tonight. Uh, that's a communication from the NPP uh, on the upcoming primaries. Um, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, one that is interesting. And the highlight there is a parliamentary candidate on the ticket of the NPP who was recently elected in your primaries who has resigned. And so the party is now reopening nominations there and will be holding another primary mm -hmm. in La that they could upon. There's a, a list of other areas, four of them in addition to the first one, making five where they're going to be holding uh, primaries to elect fresh and parliamentary candidates. And they've also upheld the decision um, of um, Yindi 
constituent also. So uh, the Farouk Mahama, Farouk Mahama uh, will now be um, the candidate for the area. And we have Geek Squad coming up next. Uh, Dubia is here. Hi, I'm a fan. What, Hi, you yes. what are we looking How at? How are you? I'm good. This evening we are looking at using AI tools, artificial intelligence tools to enhance our office work. <laughs> oh, I do that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I do that a lot. I, I do nothing now without, you know, any chat GPT. Okay. You know now, you, they can tell if you use chat GPT to write because well, of that some is certain keywords. Uh, that, a that is when you don't know how to use it. <laughs> because within, <laughs> yeah. within, within chat GPT, oh, if you go chat to GPT, GPT Explore, uh -huh. they have <laughs> other chat GPTs that help you. You should be a guest on Geek you know, right? Rephrase. <laughs> rephrase. Like yes, 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 yes. yes. It'll help you rephrase. You can really share with us. And, and make it humanize. In fact, they call it yeah, humanize. Yeah, humanize your, yeah. your AI generated text. Oh, yeah. 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 Come see me for consultancy. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Sure. Yeah, we're out of here. There's more when you log on to myjoinline.com. I am MFA Pao. And my name is Evan Spencer. <laughs>